When playing hours of Tekken Force mode in Tekken 4, I was thinking, damn, they should make this into its own standalone game and it would bring the series to the next level. Is this the next level? So, with fighting games that got non-fighting game spin-offs, I wonder if companies saw this as an opportunity to get people who didn't play fighting games in combo with the people who did. In reality, I think it only attracted the fighting game fans or people tricked into thinking that this was a fighting game. The colorful cast of a fighting game's roster is one of the central appeals of the genre, so when making a spin-off that's not a fighting game, you're kind of in a pickle, since you can't realistically have every single character playable if you're trying to do this grand single-player adventure, so deciding on who the main playable characters are has to be chosen wisely. Even picking the main guy might not be the best move since that doesn't mean they're the most popular or recognizable to the casual audience. When it comes to the gameplay itself, do you try to make it play similar to a fighting game with a bunch of moves and combo strings? Or do you just go in a completely different direction so people can instantly know this is its own thing with an aesthetic that they're familiar with? Let's go per genre on how these spin-offs pan out, and if these are successes in one way or another. Just so we're clear, a fighting game character appearing as a guest character in a non-fighting game is a topic for another video someday. So no Urban Rain, PsyOps, Asura's Wrath, etc, etc. Also, I'm gonna save the casino and mobile game spin-offs for another time, otherwise this video would take years to make. Just gonna try to stick with console games for the most part here. You're not gonna see Project Cross Zone or whatnot, since fighting game characters need to make up a majority of the cast or have the branding from those fighting game series in the title or top billing, blah blah blah, you get it. I'm starting off on shaky ground here, but retroactively Final Fight could somewhat be considered a fighting game spinoff. Final Fight's original title was Street Fighter 89, which would have made it the second Street Fighter game. But since it really didn't have anything to do with Street Fighter, the title was changed and it became its own thing. I don't think the original Final Fight was meant to take place in the Street Fighter lore at first. When Final Fight 2 and 3 were released on the SNES, it kinda shifted to this shared world with Street Fighter with subtle nods. It was fully embraced with the release of the original Street Fighter Alpha by including Guy and Sodom. Final Fight is of course remembered as a classic in video game arcade history, but I don't think having Final Fight 2 and 3 being SNES exclusives did it any favors for its legacy in the long run. Both of these sequels aren't bad obviously, but they have only been re-released through Nintendo's since shutdown virtual consoles on the Wii U and the new 3DS. The original Final Fight is referenced in so many Capcom games beyond Street Fighter. The stages in the original even appear multiple times in other Capcom games. Final Fight 2 and 3 are referenced far less, but characters like Maki and Lucia have been playable in other Street Fighter games. Maybe Dean will finally get his time to shine in Street Fighter 6. Mighty Final Fight on the NES was perhaps part of this Nintendo exclusivity. With the NES install base being so huge, Maybe Capcom wanted to expand the audience to those who hadn't upgraded to the SNES yet. It wouldn't be too far-fetched since Capcom was still cranking out Mega Mans on the NES long after the Super Nintendo release. Regardless, doesn't seem like the game sold too much since the copies that are in circulation go for quite a bit, which is typically a sign not many are in circulation. It's a bummer too since Mighty Final Fight is quite the charming little game. Everyone is in a chibi style, and all the characters have this expressiveness about them. I love the banter between bosses, the music is catchy, and the environments are diverse and colorful. This late NES era style is what most faux retro games copy. Not the early stuff that didn't know how to use the hardware, but a game in the vein of Mighty Final Fight with its brighter color palettes. This game though has no multiplayer, so when you beat the 40 minute main game, that's all she wrote. The Final Fight series tried to make a gritty comeback with Final Fight Revenge on the PS2 and Xbox, and it wasn't received all too well critically or commercially. It probably didn't help that Beatdown and Urban Rain, which are similar style games, came out a few months prior. Street Fighter makes a big cameo here with Kami as a secret boss. This time, she's got pants. Shockingly, this is an outfit that's brought back in Fortnite of all things as Kami's alt, but with even longer pants that are based on the original concept art of Streetwise. 
I like both versions of the outfit, but I think the short pants are more fitting. Anyhow, with the exception of the camera, this game doesn't feel all too bad, but it does get pretty old real quick. They throw a lot of mini games at you between the repetitive fights and the slow story. Guy, Hagar, and Cody do make appearances for a little bit, but you're stuck playing as Cody's brother Kyle, who hasn't been mentioned before or after this game. Streetwise has some bright spots such as the arcade mode, which can be played co-op with two players and is probably the ideal way to experience this game. It's the length of what a traditional Final Fight game normally is. You can tell this was probably put together in a hurry, but I'm glad it was included since in this mode you don't have to fight with the camera and you can actually play as the Final Fight characters you'd want to play as. I just wish Kami was a playable character instead of being a random boss, which again shows this was kinda slapped together and takes away from the Kami boss fight in the main story. Also hey, this game's soundtrack is incredible, from the remix songs of the first Final Fight to the licensed tunes from Slipknot and RZA. My personal favorite song is They Fightin' by 334 Mob, just such an unrelenting song that goes super hard. I wish I could play some of it now, but I'm sure you know why I can't, since this is a licensed tune. In the world of the internet where everything is the best game ever or the worst game ever, this title is very middle of the road. Although I would have told you that this was the worst game ever when I found out my game didn't autosave and I had to play through the first two hours of the game again, hence why most of the footage playing now isn't from my playthrough. This game's grittier and darker style does make sense given the subject material for the game, and with the right story I do think it could have worked. Sadly, that's not what happened here, since they tried a little too hard to be edgy and it comes off as a poor man's fight club with the narration from Kyle. Without saying it outright, he gives strong, you're probably wondering how I got here vibes. And that bloody looking guy in the corner, that's me. Can't say this is my most shining moment, but everyone says I got all this potential. This game being the last Final Fight is incredibly depressing, but at least Final Fight's characters and lore is far from forgotten since so many characters and environments have been in Street Fighter, with Street Fighter VI having its World Tour plot act as a pseudo new entry to Final Fight. Again, I'll make that bold claim that the five Final Fight beat'em ups are a non-fighting game spin-off to Street Fighter, at least retroactively. Another spin-off I don't think was ever truly intended to be one is Street Fighter 2010 The Final Fight. The only connection this has to Street Fighter beyond its title is the main character Ken, who became a cyborg and is trying to avenge his friend Troy. You know, Troy. In reality, the name Ken is just a localization change to the states, since his name is Kevin in the Japanese version. When the game came out in the states, it added the subtitle The Final Fight. So without that name, we're left with no connection to Street Fighter beyond the title. Don't want to dwell on this game too much, but it's clear that they just used the name to, I guess, connect it to a semi-known property for the states, even though only Street Fighter 1 was out by this time and it wasn't like it was insanely popular. They could have called this game anything and it probably wouldn't have moved the needle much in terms of sales with or without the Street Fighter name. Street Fighter 2010 though isn't as bad as the internet might make you think. This game has that classic NES difficulty, which might turn off some people's interest, but it controls really well. It gives me Mega Man vibes a bit with how it approaches music, its futuristic theming, and difficulty. Speaking of which, the first screen of the game is pretty tricky, so it could have turned some folks off. Maybe when playing this on an emulator or something, people wouldn't give this more than two minutes until they moved on to their other 500 NES games. Perhaps the bad reputation kind of stems from that, since I don't think many people legitimately own this game. If you didn't put money on the game, you're less incentivized to stick with it, and I got a feeling that's what happened here. That's just my baseless conjecture though, I wasn't alive for any of this. If you're gonna make a fighting game spinoff, the traditional arcade beat em up genre makes the smoothest transition, but it doesn't happen all too much. Yes, it happens all the time in side modes like in Tekken, but I'm talking full standalone games here. The original King of Fighters was supposed to be a three-person team beat-em-up, but we all know plans changed, though I still wish we had this in some way. 
Guilty Gear Judgment is the only other fighting game that has a traditional arcade style beat em up that wasn't just a side mode. This instead was released as a dual pack with Guilty Gear XX Reload. Smart move, in case you didn't like the beat em up aspect, you could fall back on an incredible fighter that is guaranteed to be great. I do like Judgment quite a bit though. You can select a majority of the XX cast and even play as an exclusive character being Judgment, who acts as the final boss. This guy's design is so sick, and it's a shame he's never been playable since this game. The gameplay itself is way faster than most beat em ups and I love it. The controls are very similar with the main exception of having a dedicated jump button. You can perform special moves similarly as well, though thankfully doing quarter circle motions doesn't get you turned around the wrong way. Even switching between enemies both behind and in front of you is fluid and quick. This can be played two-player co-op, but since this game is a PSP exclusive, both players have to have a PSP and a copy of this game. Regarding the lore, I can't be much help there. What I have heard is that this game is canon, though I don't know if it has a huge impact on the story or not. Each character has their own story playthrough and even a unique ending. There are plenty of characters to unlock as well, adding to the replay value. Even though the characters all have unique dialogue and endings, the core of the story remains the same and there isn't any special stages certain characters go through. Give this game a shot though! Just like with most beat-em-ups, it's best with a friend, but you're gonna have to put in some extra legwork to make that happen. The next Guilty Gear spinoff, which I hesitate to even call a spinoff since the title is straight up Guilty Gear 2. I wonder what that makes Guilty Gear X then. From my understanding, Guilty Gear 2 Overture was meant to be more of a sequel to the original Guilty Gear since Sammy Studios merged with Sega and Arc System Works didn't have the legal rights to use any of the new characters introduced from Guilty Gear X and any iterations after. One of the central characters was Kai Sun Sen, whose mother is Dizzy, who was introduced in Guilty Gear X. Since this was the case, Dizzy's name is never mentioned at all and as far as I know wasn't blatantly shown. It was somewhat more speculative on who the mother actually was at this time. She was given the name Maiden of the Grove so that they could talk about her without saying the name Dizzy. Thankfully, the speculation was able to come to an end once Arc Systems got the rights back in 2011. When Guilty Gear Xrd came out, it was confirmed Sin's mother was indeed Dizzy. Back to Guilty Gear 2. This title had a huge shift in genre from fighting game to something that is like Dynasty Warriors, but with more RTS elements allowing you to command NPC allies. To my knowledge, the Dynasty Warriors games prior didn't have much in the way of commanding your army or your army of NPCs. Brutal Legend was a game that came to mind when playing. Maybe it's because of the genre and the heavy metal theme, but Guilty Gear 2 predates Brutal Legend by a good two years. Only speculating, but I assume the reason for this shift in genre is because if they did another fighter, a lot of compromises in the roster would have to be made. Since they couldn't use any of the characters from Guilty Gear X, fans might not have been pleased. Potentially, even using the sprites in Guilty Gear X wasn't even allowed since new sprite-based fighters in the Xbox 360 gen weren't commonplace, and starting essentially from scratch or using lower budget 3D models might have been less than ideal, therefore forcing them out of their comfort zone to try something new to keep the IP they owned. As interesting as this is, the members of the army you control are all the same. You command literal bots, but maybe it was easier in the hardware to have a bunch of less complex models on screen. Despite the shift in genre, Guilty Gear 2 has a lot of options you'd find in a fighting game, like a local versus mode and a training mode. The attempt to make this a legitimately competitive game was admirable, and I'm not sure how people took to the game at this time. This I don't think is a bad game at all, but it's certainly not for me. RTS games in general are just too slow and boring for me since I have no sense of delayed gratification when playing an RTS. I'm not the right person to break down all of the minute mechanics or even tell if this could qualify as an RTS at all. Brutal Legend I did quite enjoy, but that game kinda tricked my dumbass since I had no idea it was an RTS from the commercials I saw or even the demo. But the story pushed me through because I wanted to explore that world. 
Guilty Gear is a world I understand very little. I'm sure I'd appreciate it once I deep dive into it, but it's not a premise that can be explained quickly. Maybe if like Tekken did this exact type of gameplay, I'd push myself all the way to the credits since I love that world, but who knows. Well hey, here's Tekken's Nina Williams' Death by Degrees. As a young Tekken fan, when I first heard about Death by Degrees, I was stoked. Not because the main character was Nina, I don't care about her, but I thought that this would open the door for other Tekken characters having their own games like Yoshimitsu, King, or maybe a Jun origin story. Perhaps if this game was a critical commercial success, that could have happened, but sadly, no Yoshimitsu game for me. It makes sense for Nina to go first though, if we're not doing the Mishima family at all and we have to go for someone else. Nina is an incredibly popular and iconic character, so I get it. The look of Nina and, spoiler, Anna, look very different in this game than in the Tekken series proper. I think this game goes for a more realistic approach to the faces, perhaps. It's not ugly or anything, it's just different and it threw me off a bit. You'd think that a game in the Tekken universe would just be a full game version of the Tekken Force mode based on this footage. It kinda has elements of that, but Death by Degrees is more comparable to classic Resident Evils more than anything, with going through a singular environment and uncovering items to unlock more areas, in addition to the puzzles, the fixed camera angles, and readable files for more backstory. We got some mild stealth elements to where you can stealth kill enemies, but if you get caught, you have to fight off a group of enemies. But if you go through a door mid-chase, they sometimes just forget about you. The fighting itself is quite unique, since you need to move the right analog stick to strike enemies. The direction you move the stick towards is the area you'll strike. This strangely works since you get surrounded frequently. In Tekken Force, there weren't many options to fix that unless you knew that character's moveset and you knew the exact move to solve that. Here, it's pretty easy hitting enemies surrounding you. I did think that it was odd that Nina exclusively kicks when she doesn't specialize in just that in the proper Tekken games. She uses her hands just as much. Even with the moves you unlock, there aren't any punches. I do believe that this is because the reach of the kicks is easier to judge while using an analog stick compared to the shorter reach of her hands. If it was just her hands being used, perhaps it wouldn't make as much sense to use the stick since you'd have to be much faster with the inputs. Having a mix of both would be frustrating for the player to have an inconsistent use of short and long range moves. You might think this issue could have been solved by maybe holding the L1 to toggle punches, but again, the speed of hitting that stick would be perceived as faster, and spamming the stick would make the player have less control over who they're targeting. The best comparison to how this controls I can think of is Metal Gear Solid's two sword controls, but here it's much less fluid. Coincidentally, later in this game, you find guns and swords that make the game way easier, and they control similarly to the kicking as well. Sometimes you land an x-ray hit either from sword kills or stealth kills. There's even a move where you target certain points to incapacitate them for a while. This predates MK9's x-ray mode and it happens pretty seamlessly and makes your moves have much more impact to them. I briefly mentioned before, like Resident Evil, we have the fixed camera angles, and I do like this since it shows off the environment and makes the game look cinematic. Although it poses an issue if you're trying to be stealthy, since you might walk into a room and the game doesn't give you a chance to see the enemy's line of sight. You can change the camera angle to a behind the back one, but you have to be running to use it. This makes it disorienting if you're trying to like see in front of you for just a moment. A first person viewer like Metal Gear could have solved this, but that first person view is reserved only for sniping and swimming sections. To save in this game, you have to look for signals since the save spots are hidden. It's pretty easy to find them, but I thought this was a unique idea to saving. The story of this game is not as exciting as the main Tekken story or even Nina's story in Tekken and she's just a side character in that. Long story short, the CIA hired Nina to infiltrate a luxury cruise ship to stop a criminal group that is gonna obtain some crazy super weapon to take over the world or something. The story isn't presented in an interesting way, and Nina herself isn't all that interesting for me to personally invest myself in her character. 
She's certainly cool and only speaks when she has to, but I don't really care about Nina all that much here. They do briefly go into her backstory on the death of her father, and you do run into Anna for that classic rivalry. Not too many Tekken connections here overall though. Dr. Baskanovich is mentioned in a file, these robots that are reminiscent of Jack, as well as Heihachi kinda appearing out of nowhere as the final boss. Well, to be fair, Heihachi only appears as the final boss in a New Game Plus file and after unlocking and completing Anna's shorter story mode. Anna is originally the final boss, but it's hilarious Heihachi kicks her out of the way. This is a fitting secret final boss, but I wish it had a little bit more build up to it. I do love that Nina wins here, and it shows that it's not just the Mishima family that can win amongst themselves and lets Nina shine a bit. That being said, once you win, there's no cutscene acknowledging this victory, and Heihachi is just gone, never to be mentioned or seen again. So not sure if Nina beating Heihachi is even canon, or this game as a whole for that matter. This game doesn't affect the overall Tekken story that much anyways, so it's probably harmless to the lore if it is. I hear people blast this game a lot, but I think it's not half bad. The environment, for mostly taking place on a ship, is pretty glamorous looking. The music is not the bumpin' Tekken music I'm used to, but it also matches the espionage thriller tone. I admire that instead of taking the easy way and just doing a beat-em-up, Namco shot for the stars and went for a stealthy action puzzle game. Once you beat the game, there's plenty of unlockable content. Anna has her separate shorter campaign, as well as some challenge modes where you only snipe, only fight, solve puzzles, costumes, etc. So maybe give this game a shot if you're a curious Tekken fan. A Namco game that does play it safe and has the problems Death by Degrees could have had was Soul Calibur Legends for the Wii. This game is mostly just a beat-em-up, which could have been fine, but it's on the Wii. Meaning we're staring down the barrel of the gun, that is, motion controls. Playing this for a long time is exhausting, since you have to swing that Wii remote so much. This game would have benefited greatly from having the option to use buttons for your main attacks, to the point where I had to resort to mapping the attack commands myself in an emulator, if I were to hypothetically use one. In Soul Calibur Legends, you mostly play as Siegfried and a handful of other characters in the Soul Calibur world, so at least we got a bit of variety here. Doesn't stop this game from being boring though. You just hack away at groups of enemies with the same couple of moves in these environments that aren't gonna light the world on fire. Soul Calibur always goes ham for their stages with incredibly rich detail, and I get that can't happen in a whole level for a game like this, but they could have at least tried to make it look a little less generic here instead of forest level, a barren pirate ship, or a barren Egyptian tomb. This game makes me wish the real Soul Calibur games had a Tekken Force-esque mode. At least then, I'd have a variety of moves at my disposal. I don't know if it's supposed to take place in Tekken's world despite having dragons and skeletons. The game's lore says these monsters are here because of Soul Edge, so maybe they go away when Soul Edge does too. Even with that reasoning, there's far too many issues with both games having a shared world. Like, do the history books in Tekken document the Lizardman civilization? Regardless, Soul Calibur was always a bit dry compared to the zaniness of Tekken. Soul Calibur Legends tries its best to expand the lore, with it taking place after Soul Blade and before Soul Calibur, I believe, despite the fact that some of these characters have their Soul Calibur 3 look. The story has Siegfried and pals try and save a kingdom from this giant monster, with him having two months to recover the pieces of Soul Edge to use it to save the kingdom. There's betrayals and shenanigans along the way, but I wasn't invested enough to see it all the way through. We do have some multiplayer modes at least, even though you can't play the main story co-op. Seems like a wasted opportunity. You can play certain co-op specific missions in the multiplayer mode though, which are probably the most fun I've had with the game. There's also a mode where you race a friend to get pieces of the Soul Edge first, and a straight up versus mode, something I wish Death by Degrees had. You might have also noticed we have Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia as a playable guest character. It's a cool addition that even in a spin-off Soul Calibur game, they still got a guest character included since that tradition is so closely associated with the series. Too bad Lloyd is wasted in this game though, and wasn't in like, Soul Calibur 3 instead. 
King of Fighters is a series with loads of story and a huge world spanning many games. And in the days of the internet not being what it is today, it'd be difficult to keep up with the lore. For fans who wanted a primer of the lore, there was the King of Fighters 96 Neo Geo collection on the failed Neo Geo CD. This was less a game and more so an encyclopedia to the KOF story up to that point. We got videos going into the plot of the Orochi saga, Orochi's origins, and the Kusanagi clan and all that. It also has a character profile feature where you select a character from the 96 roster, and man this is so cool. Characters will tell you their likes, dislikes, favorite foods, and more, with the character themselves going through it with you. There are some translations on a site that goes through this dialogue, I'll put a link in the description, certainly check it out if you want to know Geese's favorite food. There is also a command list mode where you can do the command list. It sounds ridiculous now, but you couldn't look up moves for your characters on the internet back then, and sometimes not even in the game itself, so this would be a great resource for that info or maybe your only resource. You even have a training mode where you can try the moves yourselves, which is great there's an actual game aspect here. You can't adjust any training options though, and it ends when the CPU beats your character. Still. Pretty useful since training modes also weren't crazy common to include in your fighter back then. One of my favorite modes is sound play. I thought this would just be the music player for the KOF 96 soundtrack, which it is, but it's also the gallery mode in disguise. While the music plays, you can watch slideshows of concept art I've never seen before, which is a great find. You can also choose a character with their stage as the background while you're listening to the music if you're trying to vibe out with your main. Pretty sweet little title for KOF fans, who I'm sure got a kick out of this at its release. Virtua Fighter, for a series with almost zero story in the mainline games themselves, has some spin-offs that I think were trying to change that, or at least get you to understand the characters themselves a bit more. Believe it or not, Shenmue started as a spin-off to Virtua Fighter, showing the origins of poster boy Akira. It later pivoted into being its own thing, which is a bummer because this could have been an opportunity to have Shenmue and Virtua Fighter help each other out. Having characters appear in either series and giving background to them would help players get more invested with the characters in both series, like putting a young Jackie in Shenmue to show the origins of that character, or putting Ren in Virtua Fighter. I don't know, maybe that's dumb, but I think for two more niche series, it would have been helpful for them both to attract fans from either series. This isn't the reality we live in though. The main Virtua Fighter connection to Shenmue is the fighting engine used in the first two games. Shenmue plays like a Virtua Fighter game and has little references sprinkled in. The first proper Virtua Fighter spin-off was the CG Portrait series, which were super cheap Sega Saturn discs where you just view pictures of one character. There were 10 of these total, and each disc has its own character gallery, but that's all this is. This could have been a mode in Virtua Fighter 3 or something, but they did this instead. Sure, these are cheap, but after you view these pics, what do you do with them? Oh, there's a karaoke mode, but it's one single song. Even a Game Gear version of this, which has the same pics as the Saturn version, but in the Virtua Kid style. I guess the sequel to these picture CDs was Virtua Fighter History on the Dreamcast. This was a two-disc package that was included with Shenmue 2 only in Japan. The first disc being the Virtua Fighter 4 Passport, which solely has a website link for Virtua Fighter 4, which seems silly even back then. The second disc has more of the history of VF, showing footage of all the games up to that point, as well as some beta footage and ending cutscenes. We also have a music library of the mainline games and Virtua Kids, so already this has more value than the Sega Saturn Portrait games. I'm a bit hesitant to even call these gallery disc games since there is no game here, but when else am I going to talk about these weird little releases? The actual real proper Virtua game spinoff was a GameCube and PS2 title called Virtua Quest. This game takes place in the distant future in the Virtua Fighter world, where a kid named Sei explores a digital world called the Nexus. Huh. I feel like calling it Virtua Reality would have been more fitting, but whatever, who cares. This kid has to stop this group of cyber terrorists called Judgment 6 by collecting the Virtua Souls. Beyond the group, Judgment 6, which is a part of the VF lore, the main connection to Virtua Fighter are these Virtua Souls, which have you gain moves from characters in the series. 
The characters talk about themselves a little bit, and it's the only time in a game you actually hear the characters talk about the story or their background in any way. The gameplay has elements of a beat-em-up mixed with some rough platforming. The fighting doesn't feel super satisfying since it's a bit loose, like your character doesn't lock on to who you're fighting. This makes it feel that not every hit is really connecting. This is absolutely my least favorite game I've talked about so far in so many aspects beyond just the fighting. The platforming is very unfair with how high your jumps are and the lack of control in the air, making judging where the platforms are very difficult. The story is also not super exciting and comes off as budget.hack. The music isn't too bad at least, not something I'm gonna remember all too much, but in terms of highlights, this is certainly the biggest one. Perhaps I'm speaking way too soon saying Virtual Quest is the worst game so far, because we have the trio of spin-off action games from Mortal Kombat. A couple of these games I'm sure you've heard pan to death in other videos. Mortal Kombat Sub-Zero and Mortal Kombat Special Forces were attempts from the co-creator of Mortal Kombat, John Tobias, to expand the mythos of the MK story. It's no secret that both of these games are fucking awful. Although Mortal Kombat Sub-Zero has a control scheme I think could have worked. It plays exactly like a classic MK game, but it's when we get to the platforming is when this becomes an issue. This game is hard for the wrong reasons. If this game, for the most part, was a straight line where you fight a bunch of dudes like a beat-em-up, then sure, it gets old, but I think it would be remembered a bit more fondly. These jumps weren't meant for the level of platforming being asked here, with one-hit kill traps that are hard to predict, and just getting stuck on what to do. I do think the story is pretty cool though. You play as Sub-Zero or Bihan before the events of Mortal Kombat 1, trying to find Shinnok's amulet for Quan Chi. If you choose to kill Scorpion in the first stage, it sets in motion him coming back as the undead version we all know seeking revenge. We got a good bit of appearances of other MK characters like Fujin, Shinnok, Raiden, and Serena. The bulk of the narrative is told through these super cheesy live action cutscenes in the PS1 version. We got it all with the goofy costumes on top of the overacting, but it's incredibly charming and my favorite part of the game. Not if you're stuck playing on the N64 though, since they couldn't stuff these cutscenes into the cart, so you're stuck with static images on text. I heard we have some plot holes in the game, making it inconsistent with the original timeline, but we're gonna come across that issue in more MK games than just this. Plot holes are the least of this game's issues. Mortal Kombat Special Forces is truly the bottom of the barrel here. This game released exclusively on the PS1, and I remember trying to buy this game since it was so cheap, but the EB Games clerk convinced me out of it. That EB Games employee saved the child's life that day. Like MK Mythologies, Special Forces also takes place before the first Mortal Kombat. You play as Jax trying to stop Kano and his gang of Black Dragon members he just broke out of prison. You might recognize Jerk from MK4, as well as Tremor, who made his debut in this game. John Tobias left midway during production of Special Forces, which probably affected the game quite a bit. One big change was Sonya originally being playable, but having to be cut. This game comes off as very budget, even for this time. I see what they were going for with the control scheme, having it similar to the layout of MK Fighters, having the X button as low punch, square as high punch, circle as low kick, and triangle as high kick, even though the low and high kicks both look pretty high. All of this doesn't mean squat, since when it's time for a fight, you're locked on the enemy, mashing away like a less fun version of Rock'em Sock'em Robots. The shooting doesn't feel all too much better. The environments are super generic video game fare. I'm assuming since this game is a budget title, they couldn't put too much work in here. The worst crime by this title is just how boring it is. At least Sub-Zero had some fun, corny cutscenes on top of some good-looking environments and character sprites. This game is ugly on all fronts, and it doesn't have any of the charm of the live-action cutscenes since we have 3D rendered ones instead. There is nothing here to grasp onto, and it's probably a good reason the Mortal Kombat series had to take a little break until Deadly Alliance in 2002. This is the type of hot garbage I actually do recommend people playing, but it's only so you can see what a truly terrible game is. 
I'm sure you've heard a lot about this game, but reviews and videos like this can't do justice on how it feels and the slog you have to go through unless you do it yourself. I'm not saying beat the game, but maybe 30 minutes at the minimum. To understand what makes a game great, it's important to know what makes a game bad. It might be more worthwhile and educational than you think. Trust me on this one, this isn't a long control. Or don't, I can't tell you what to do. Thankfully, third time's the charm since Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks is a vast quantum leap in improvement. This honestly might be one of the best fighting game spin-offs. The platforming is way better, the story is an interesting retelling of MK2, and the actual fighting feels fluid and fast. You can choose between Liu Kang and Kung Lao, with both characters feeling wholly unique with their own normals and special moves. After beating the game, you can unlock Scorpion and Sub-Zero, who also play different from each other. The boss fights are much grander in scale than I expected. It reminded me of God of War in a way, with how the boss fights would happen in different phases and make the fight seem more cinematic. Like Reptile and Baraka, who are the ultimate jobbers, got boss fights that made them seem pretty intimidating. My favorite aspect though is the multiplayer. You can play the whole story co-op with a shared health bar. You can't choose to play that co-op profile solo or play a co-op playthrough with your single player profile. Not a deal breaker, just a little annoying. I know for a fact there's some plot inconsistencies in the lore here too, but I'm just gonna assume this game takes place in its own timeline, like how I assume MK vs DC most likely does. This game's versus mode is pretty fun too, since the stage hazards and items add plenty of chaos to a match and keep things interesting. Even if you're not a Mortal Kombat fan, I still recommend this title. I wish it got expanded on even further with a sequel, and that was supposed to happen with Sub-Zero and Scorpion being the lead characters. But with Midway's financial problems, which led to the studio closing down, that game sadly had to be cancelled. The most recent release for a non-fighting game spin-off is actually from the series Blaze Blue, called Blaze Blue Entropy Effect. This is only on PC right now and was on early access for a pretty long time, but as of writing this video, is supposed to leave early access relatively soon. This is a roguelike, which I don't think I've ever played a single roguelike before for the record. You may think an early access game shouldn't be scrutinized since it's technically not done, and I would agree on some levels, but this isn't a free demo or anything, it costs money. Once you start charging money, it's fair game to criticize at that point. Blaze Boot Entropy is mostly pretty good. The look of the game is awesome, and the playable Blaze Blue cast, I'm assuming, are using the sprites from the previous games, which of course still hold up. But I don't know if it's just me, but this looks very unblaze blue to me. I remember blaze blue stages being stuffed to the brim with insane detail and color. It looks like we're in some Neo Tokyo looking place, and even with the later levels, this hasn't really changed. With music that's more atmospheric and not the blaring guitars I've come to expect from a blaze blue soundtrack. The plot of this game I couldn't understand since it's all in the hub of the game. Maybe that will be elaborated on when this game leaves early access. Like I said, I don't play roguelike, so I'm not sure if this would be considered a good one, but to me this feels pretty solid. I love the speed of this game with how you can dash in between enemies on the ground or the air. All the characters on offer here also feel very unique and faithful to how they play in the fighting games. This is definitely a game to keep an eye on when it officially releases. I do get the feeling though that this game is going to have some microtransactions for your character's perks between stages, but let's hope I'm wrong here. Fighting game spinoffs don't always stay in just the action game camp, even though that's the genre that would make the most sense to transition to. Some series have gone more experimental, and you can't go more experimental with the genre that's the exact opposite of a fighting game, and that's visual novels. Now, I have played and enjoyed some games in this genre before, like Phoenix Wright and Danganronpa, but to be a good visual novel, similar to a good book, you need a story that pulls you in. A visual novel's gameplay isn't usually going to be all that engaging beyond your choices in the response prompts. You're mostly just letting the narrative unfold, so it has to be a bit more engaging for its player. Or reader, I should say. 
Blaze Blue has two visual novels on the PS3, Vita, and PC called X Blaze Code Embryo and X Blaze Lost Memories. I heard the first game is just fine, whether you're a Blaze Blue fan or not. Just kind of a middle of the road visual novel, and not the worst entry point of the Blaze Blue story for the most part. I still ain't reading it though. The sequel Lost Memories I heard was way too confusing to keep up with, and maybe the hardcore Blaze Blue heads would eat this game up, but someone like me isn't gonna really be into either of these titles regardless. I have a pretty good surface level understanding of Blaze Blue lore, but in spite of that, I just couldn't be bothered to buy these games and play them for like 30 minutes each for me to know it's not for me. I watched a good amount of the first game on YouTube, and all the plot immediately left my brain on what I just watched the moment it stopped. The visual novel style works for Blaze Blue fans since it's kind of how the story's delivered in the story mode of the fighting games. But at least with that, there are fights in between. Can't say the same here. Some characters in the visual novels eventually made their way to the fighting game in later updated versions, so it's cool these spin-offs are not only canon, but more legitimized by having that crossover. Still ain't for me though. For a deeper dive into both these games and the Blaze Blue series as a whole, I do recommend checking out Thorgy Arcade's Blaze Blue Retrospective. He does an excellent job making the insane lore incredibly digestible. I especially recommend it if you're not a Blaze Blue fan at all, since this video was a great gateway into the series for me, and perhaps it will be for you too. For a world that is a bit easier to digest, we have the SNK Fighters. A lot of SNK games take place in the same world, or at least have a lot of crossover with each other, so looking to have that world explored is always interesting to me. We do have a Samurai Shodan visual novel, with Nakaru being the most prevalent character in the game, as well as King of Fighters, Kyo, starring, well, Kyo. The Sam Show visual novel is called Nakaru Anohita Kara no Okurimono. Sorry if I butchered that, let's just call it Nakaru the gift she gave me. You don't play this game in Nakaru's perspective, but rather as a little girl named Kamui Kotan, who I don't even think has an official render. This game released on PC and Dreamcast, and only in Japan. A fan translation was done by Derek Pascrell and his team, and it was finished pretty recently too. This game released with an OVA prequel DVD that sets up the plot pretty well, and I'm sure you can find this English subtitle to OVA if you do a little bit of digging. The story isn't too bad, but it's pretty simple. Animals and people are becoming randomly violent, and you gotta figure out what's going on in your little peaceful village. This is, of course, between a lot of dialogue with some minigames sprinkled in. Although, from the minigames I've played, being a quiz and flute player, there are less so minigames and more just the game checking if you're awake. I do wish this were in Nakaru's perspective, but I suppose it makes the narrative more thrilling if you play as a character that isn't as capable of defending herself. It's neat you can use a keyboard or a mouse to play this game, and I wish all Dreamcast games had this option, but for a visual novel, you're just gonna do this instead of this. King of Fighters Kyo has sadly yet to get a fan translation, so understandably, I can't say too much about this game, and that's too bad since there are a lot of characters I'd like to learn more about, like Kyo's cool motorcycle chick cousin Aoi, who has the power of purple and red flames, or Gora Diamond's girlfriend, or even Kyo's girlfriend, who is in a lot of games but doesn't get to talk all that much. This game has turn-based battles thrown in every now and then, so this would probably be considered a hybrid of an RPG and a visual novel. There's even a local multiplayer option, so you and a friend can play KOF competitively in a turn-based battle. You just have to unlock all the characters, and both of you would have to be able to read Japanese. This game and the Rival School's dating sim mode is near the top of games I'd want translated the most. We have a Spanish fan translation, but no English yet. Until then, all we can do is wait and see if that ever happens. Days of Memories is a dating sim that was exclusively released on Japanese phones in 2005. Normally, I wouldn't be talking about a phone game, but it has a trilogy of games released on the DS, so let's talk about it. They haven't been translated at all, so let's bust out the Google Translate and butcher the language even more. Days of Memories features many dateable women in the KOF, Samurai Showdown, Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, Last Blade, and even Maximum Impact games. The first game has you play as a high school student where Athena is your homeroom homie, 
and in the second, you're a journalist trying to get a scoop or something. Though the status of the character's schooling is unknown to me, since it seems like they're going in and out of a high school. The third looks like you're a college student based on how the rooms look. You sometimes run into male characters like Kyo, Iori, or Ryo. From what I've seen so far, this game seems packed with plenty of smoochable SNK characters. In the second game specifically, it looks like you can play as a girl and date some of the dudes, which is perfect. Not sure if it's in the third game though, I couldn't find it with any digging. I do love this alternative timeline where everyone's the same age and all go to school together. That's a clever spin, and you even have the same old rivalries from the fighting games, like Chizuru hating anyone from the Orochi group like Mature. The art looks pretty great, but seems to change between games. Not sure if it's the same artist changing styles, but it makes each game seemingly unique if you're just going through the pictures like I did. A genre I have almost zero experience in is card games. I never played Yu-Gi-Oh! or the Pokemon card games ever. I would just collect the cards because the art was cool. In a video game, using cards always seemed kind of lame to me. Like, why would I play that over a turn-based battle like an RPG instead? Even for a series I love, if there was a card game spin-off, I wasn't gonna touch it. My attitude is no different with fighting games. Tekken Card Battle on the Wonder Swan has really cool sprite art with a Tekken 3 theme, but the overworld and battles are just not my thing. Getting the higher number than your opponent seems to be the meta of this game, so it doesn't seem to be too deep. But how the selection roulette moves is seemingly random. You'll have to do your best to time where it stops for the most useful card. Just need to get a higher number than your opponent and pick up different cards along the way that allow you to grab, do air combos, or block. Maybe blocking should have just been a selectable choice for the player, since it's a choice that keeps you safe from an attack, but also allows your opponent to go again, increasing the risk of making that choice. I don't know, I feel like there's no player choices being made at all in this game, so at least a block prompt would be something. I do like the 8-bit versions of Tekken 3 music, which has some charm to it, and the digitized voice of the announcer sounds surprisingly good. The Tekken Fight. Battle Arena Toshinden had a card game too, called Toshinden Card Quest, which is formatted like a board game. I barely have any idea what's going on here. Sometimes these events happen to give or take away cards, and sometimes you do card battles, but it's all in Japanese, so the deep mechanics of this game are yet again lost on me. The most celebrated of the card games based on fighting games seems to be SNK vs Capcom Card Fighters Clash, which has a couple of games on the Neo Geo Pocket and the DS. This does look the most interesting to me since the games are in English and has some really awesome sprites of the character cards. The first game is on the Switch, so perhaps one day I'll check this game out and give it the proper attention it deserves. This game has a pretty big cult following and I'd love to explore why. Puzzle games. Now that's a genre I'm all about. There's not too many of these standalone games that I'm aware of that were from fighting games, but the most prominent and first I'm aware existed is Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. Odd title since this is the first game, but I get it's spoofing Street Fighter 2 Turbo's title. Puzzle Fighter is the game I show off to people who don't really play fighting games. This puzzle game has the spirit of a fighting game beyond just its aesthetics, where it still brings out that competitiveness like if it were a fighter. The premise is simple. Get all the gem colors to match, so when you use the electric orbs of the same color, the gems touching that orb all disappear. And you want to do that enough so that your opponent's gems touch the ceiling before yours do. You can never bring down your guard because the tide can turn in the blink of an eye. If you chain your combos enough, you always have a chance of victory. This oozes charm too, from the chibi sprite art style to the light-hearted remixes of the character themes. Pretty much half the cast are Street Fighter characters, and the other half are Darkstalkers, with a hidden Cyberbots character Devilot thrown into the mix as well. An HD remake of this game exists called Super Puzzle Fighter 2 HD Remix. It released on the Xbox 360 and PS3, and it's pretty much the same game but prettier. The sprites are not redone, but the backgrounds, character portraits, gems, and music are. It's also backwards compatible on the Xbox One, 
so if you have access to that, I recommend nabbing this version right away. Another standalone puzzle game is Puzzle Arena Toshinden, and this one is a bit too obtuse for me to enjoy. The character sprites in the background are awesome to see, and the Battle Arena Toshinden soundtrack is ripped from the first game and fits pretty well here. But all you do is match three of the same colored ball, and I don't know, it doesn't seem as exciting as Puzzle Fighter, which released before this. You can taunt, but it doesn't seem to do anything. You can't control your screen for a sec, but your opponent still can. I guess you distract them a bit. Once the meter is full, super moves can turn the tide quickly, but they're kind of too OP and make matches longer than they should and will throw any planning out the window. Perhaps there's a level of strategy I'm not understanding here that would make me appreciate it more, but to me it doesn't have the same level of depth as most puzzle games I've played. King of Fighters just does it all. SNK had some of the cast of KOF star in a scrolling shoot 'em up game called The King of Fighters Sky Stage. This was initially released in arcades in Japan and Xbox 360. You select your KOF character, who shoots their way through enemies to fight a boss at the end of the stage that's typically from the Orochi Saga. Every character has an individual story. It's kind of like going through an arcade ladder, with characters having unique dialogue with the bosses and an ending. Even if you play this with two players, the characters go through a mini buddy cop story and each pairing combination has a unique story as well. Terry and Iori barely interact in the games, and having a super happy-go-lucky Terry with the edgy aggro boy Iori is such a perfect pairing I didn't know I wanted. Performing the character's special moves is also satisfying. There's a good risk-reward system since you have to stop shooting to charge the move. This game is only like 30 minutes max, but goes beyond just the novelty and is a solid shoot-'em-up. Granted, I don't play too many of these, I don't know if this is on like Ikaruga's level or anything, but I enjoyed going through the game a few times. This also does something I'm pretty sure is unique to this genre, and that's a versus mode. You're probably thinking that the goal is to get a higher score than the other player, and that's certainly part of it, but you actually have to fight each other. You play through a normal stage, but whoever has the higher judgment meter at the end is the winner. To increase said judgment gauge, the more in front of the screen you are, the faster it grows. But doing that increases the risk of getting shot since you have less time to dodge and your opponent can attack you from behind. It's a constant back and forth of who's in front or not, and it's something I wish was expanded upon further in other games of this genre. It's not brought up often, but this game did get a sequel and a port on the PSP called Neo Geo Heroes Ultimate Shooting. The majority of the cast are from fighting games, so I'm still counting this. We now have a Sam Show rep, Aroha, as well as probably the second most popular Last Blade character, Akari. This package has a bit more to offer than KOF Sky Stage, since we have a challenge mode and a gallery mode here. In addition, the entirety of KOF Sky Stage is also included in the game as well. Can't speak to how the multiplayer is, since I need another PSP to do it, but I'd certainly love to try it sometime. The sequel here has a branching arcade ladder, so you can choose your path on which boss you'll face at the end of the stage. The challenge of a shmup like this on a handheld is the screen size. These games are on vertical screens for the most part, so on a widescreen handheld, that's a lot of unused screen space. You can have the screen flip horizontally and control like a vertical game if you hold your PSP that way, but if you do that or just play horizontally, it's just not the same. My favorite of the fighting game shoot 'em ups is Capcom's Cannon Spike or Gun Spike in Japan. We all know Cannon Spike is the better title. This was released in arcades and on the Sega Dreamcast. Cannon Spike stars Kami and Charlie Nash, who get strapped with guns and rollerblades to clear out a room of enemies in single room stages. Other than just shooting, you can also perform close range attacks as well as screen filling special moves I'm sure you'd recognize. We also have a bonus fighting game character, BB Hood, who brought a scooter instead of skates, and the appearance of who I assume is Vega. His name is Fallen Balrog, which is his Japanese name. He's got a bondage theme going on in addition to having two bloody claws. 
I suppose this game takes place in an alternate future where Charlie never died and Vega fell on hard times. There's other non-fighting game characters here like Classic Mega Man, a crazy armored version of Arthur and Sheba from Three Wonders. We also have Simone who's inspired by Lin Kurosawa from the Aliens vs Predator Capcom beat-em-up. Capcom just wants to use Lin so badly in so many games like Ken and Spike and CVS2, but just have to keep getting creative it seems. Ken and Spike controls really well for not being a true twin stick shooter since regardless if you're playing the arcade version or the Dreamcast version, you only have a single stick. You can shoot in a single direction while strafing or lock on and circle your target. You'd think that simply touching the enemy would hurt you since it does in similar games, but it doesn't, which makes the melee attacks much more useful since it would be hard to judge the range of the enemies if you're trying to avoid getting touched. Side note, but the death sounds of the enemy sounds like they're going wee as they die. <laughs> The stages are seemingly random since I've started this game multiple times with the same character and it's been different every time. It's a good artificial way to keep the game fresh if you keep coming back to it in an arcade setting. This is also a quickie like KOF Sky Mission and can be pretty tough as well. If you've got an hour or two, this is a great game to play all the way through and it's also the perfect local co-op game since there's a single room for each stage and your characters can go pretty far apart without it getting confusing. The only standalone sports game I can think of that has a fighting game spinoff are the Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball games. These are probably the most well-known fighting game spinoffs. I know people who thought Dewey the fighting game was a spin-off from these games which is depressing. This volleyball series has three mainline games with spin-offs of their own. I don't play many volleyball games or anything, but to me the actual mechanics here seem competent enough. Though I don't know if this is a game I play just for its gameplay because it's not very exciting. I've seen these characters do insane shit all the time in Dewey or Ninja Gaiden and I wish there was some level of that here. Maybe if they had a genuinely exciting volleyball game, people would remember this game beyond being the horny DOA game. I know that's not the point, and it's solely for the sex appeal, but even if you replace these chicks with hot guys from DOA, my opinions wouldn't change. That's why the true bulk of the game is in the dating sim aspect of the game. After you pick who you want to play as, you try and woo another DOA lady as you go through the story. There go those quotes again. You have a limited time to accomplish this in a playthrough, making time management key. You do tasks like play minigames and gamble to win Zack Bucks to buy gifts for the waifu of choice. And it's so slow and painful to go through. Sometimes, no matter how many gifts you give them, they just don't want to hang out with you. This series is the ultimate tease. I'd be curious to know if this game is considered canon to DOA lore. Like, didn't Christy kill Helena's mom and they're just hanging out like everything's fine? This game's lore has Zack take all the DOA girls on vacation on Zack Island. When the vacation's over, the island just like blows up or something. In the first DOA game, Zack was voiced by North Korean ambassador Dennis Rodman. I guess cause Zack was allegedly based on him and Team Ninja thought it'd be a cute full circle moment. This series as a whole seems like a waste to me. If you wanted to be titillated by DOA chicks, just play the fighting game. They wear bikinis and other revealing outfits in those games, plus you can play a good fighting game instead of a mediocre volleyball slash dating sim. Okay, almost done guys, almost done. This is a bit of a grab bag of genres, so I'll try to rapid fire through these. First off, Street Fighter 2 The Interactive Movie. This is an FMV game where you watch the animated movie from the perspective of one of Bison's robots, which are the same robots that monitor the fighters throughout the movie. You essentially scan fighters to gain power for the one and only fight at the very end. This is a weird premise because this is just the whole movie. Even when Ryu is having a personal flashback, the robot can see that too, apparently. The movie is dope, but this is just watching the movie with an annoying filter. There is a unique intro animation in the same style as the movie, and three endings you can obtain, two of which are also brand new animations. 
When you do play as a robot, you enter the single playable fight in the whole game against a Street Fighter 2 sprite Ryu. The robot is just a reskin Ken, and you can fight a hologram Ryu in the battle mode for practice with a CPU or a second player. You can only do this if you have a password or a save file for your robot and have gone past the first disc, since the fighting part of the game is on disc 2 and you can't boot it unless you get to it naturally. Lots of hoops we gotta jump through to play the actual gameplay part. Regardless, you're really just watching a movie. I'm reluctant to call this a fighting game since it's like 5% of the whole game. This is more or less an interactive night trap, so take that for what you will. Pro Jumper Guilty Gear Tangent is a digital-only game exclusive to the shutdown DSiWare, and it's a Guilty Gear platformer. I couldn't even emulate this game, not that I do that, so I just had to look up what footage I could find. You play as the alleged mascot of the series, Chimaki. This guy appears in a game I mentioned earlier, Guilty Gear 2 Overture, and I'm pretty sure that was his first and most prominent appearance outside of this DSiWare title. He also appears in Guilty Gear Exert as a tutorial NPC in the lobbies and on May's Backpack and Strive. He kind of looks like a radish who has a leaf covering his junk. The game feel itself is hard for me to speak on since I haven't played it, but it looks like you do some very mild platforming and occasionally hit enemies with your towel. We have six very brief stages where Chimaki's got his towel and a basket of his stuff and he just goes to bathhouses around the world, defeats a boss, and just jumps in the hot bath after. Is this guy supposed to be sole bad guy? The stages are named in a goofy way where it's a stage location with some kind of nude joke. We've been graced with names like Full Frontal Fuji, Disrobe Dungeon, or Nude York. Look, I'm sure it was late and the dev just wanted to go home to see their family that night. Similar nitpick to Blaze Blue Entropy, this world doesn't really come off as very Guilty Gear since it looks like a regular Japanese bathhouse, but later levels do get goofy, which uh, still is a very Guilty Gear. That's what happens when you have such a distinct style. Even in the spin-off games, fans are still gonna expect that same insane outlandish style. Eat beat dead spikes on for the Switch. Rhythm games are one of my favorite genres ever, and ones with fighting game songs are a great fit. The music and fighters are usually pretty upbeat and fast, which is perfect for a rhythm game. Although this comes off as a bit budget with its awful UI, having the B button on the Switch being what confirms selections on the menus, almost as if this were mapped like a PlayStation controller. Getting past that, this is a cute little game that I wish had more time to fine tune. Would have been cool if there were a bit more than 20 songs or maybe something like a multiplayer. I played a decent number of songs, but after like two, I don't know, I just started getting a headache. Maybe it's the way the background and music notes spin in a circle kind of fast. Even while dizzy, I was able to do decently on the harder difficulties, though there is not much depth to it beyond hitting the L and R buttons, so it might not have enough substance here for rhythm game fans. If this game were like 2 bucks, this would be a harmless recommendation, but that $7 price tag seems a little ballsy for this game. Quiz King of Fighters is the second game in the KOF series and has you choose a character to save Yuri from this night. I wish this game was in English because a quiz arcade game like this looks kind of fun. No Kyo or anyone original to KOF 94 are selectable, but we do have Samurai Showdown characters. Crazy to think that Sam Show characters wouldn't be playable in the mainline KOF games until like 14. You go through a linear board by rolling a number, and as you go through, you can gain perks from shops and eventually fight enemies and bosses. And by fighting, I mean fighting with knowledge. Your character takes damage each time you get a question wrong, and for each one right, your opponent takes more damage. It's cool to see the different animations for your character attacking your opponent when you're on a roll, and they have a good amount of them too since the animations don't repeat too often in a single battle. For the Neo Geo Pocket Color, another game that is only in Japanese is King of Fighters Battle de Paradise, essentially a Mario Party, but for KOF. This game is incredibly cute, and the mini games are pretty simple, but I suppose they couldn't go too crazy on a handheld game. This can only be played with two players, which I get since the boards are pretty small and the mini games are designed around two characters. Not knowing Japanese, 
I can surmise the game's goal is to make money by winning minigames or landing on event spaces or using cards to buy a KOF star. Just like Mario Party, whoever has the most stars wins. The minigames happen when you pass the minigame space, so that way it happens no matter what. A lot of the times you'll land on events that take away money or give you items. But watch out for the skull space since you'll get screwed over for sure. Even with 30 turns, this game goes pretty quickly, like maybe 20-ish minutes max, which makes sense for a handheld game like this. A game that has a bit of genres we already talked about is from ADK on the Neo Geo CD called ADK World. Featured in this game are characters from World Heroes and the obscure aggressors of Dark Combat, among other ADK characters from non-fighting games. This is a bit of a variety title with multiple minigames, so let's start with the quiz game hosted by different ADK characters, and stop me if you've heard this, it's only in Japanese. I truly want a quiz game about fighting games in English. I think that it would be an awesome digital budget title, but I know that is a very niche ask. This quiz game is missing some of the flair of Quiz of Fighters, but maybe the quality of questions in ADK World are much better. Who knows? ADK Dome is another card battling game, but I have no clue what's going on. The chibi art style is great, but that's all I can pull from this. You can also be confused with a friend in versus mode. Misery does love company and all. ADK Corner is a discussion between John the Ark and Ryoko where they talk about ADK the company and the merchandise they had and whatnot. A conversation I'd love to be privy to. Cafe de ADK is a database of some non-fighters like Magician Lord and Ninja Commando. The menu has John and Ryoko again, so maybe they're reading this info from their perspective. I can only guess. 90YY, where you control the world hero's character broken through a side-scrolling shooter. He can shoot from his gun, but also drop bombs that, after falling, shoot horizontally, and also has a close-range attack by turning his hand into a stun rod. This started off easy but ramped up in difficulty real quick, which made me grateful they give you a pretty big health bar and not just a single hit death. The last mode is one I can barely speak on, Brown's Academy, where this dude, I assume named Brown, goes through world heroes characters and goes into their backgrounds. Nothing much else beyond that, I'm afraid. Finally, there's an extras mode that you need to unlock first, but it's not worth the trouble. You can unlock an ad for a car game on the Neo Geo CD and a shoji match between, I think, the developers. It's just a bunch of pictures with commentary over it and the credits, which is the most interesting part. You play as a little blue dude and destroy the staff member's names and you'll get some art, either official and sometimes fan art, with a little note attached from that staff member. This is certainly interesting, but that's all it could be if you don't know the language, because the parts I'm truly interested in are in the commentary of the characters. This is a better budget attempt at celebrating a company's fighting game series versus Virtua Fighter's Passport Disc. That being said, this isn't at the top of my list for being in need of a translation. Samurai Showdown RPG is one of my personal favorite games on here. The Neo Geo CD version was recently translated into English by Jeff Nussbaum. This is just what it sounds like, a turn-based RPG with the Samurai Showdown characters. It uses seemingly pared down versions of the sprites from Sam Show 3 in the battles. Upon starting a new game, you can choose one of six characters as your protagonist. They all have their unique story paths and you recruit more characters into your party as the plot progresses. The world and music come together very well and give off that quiet and serious Samurai Showdown tone. In battle, you can choose to input your special moves in the vein of the fighting game, but maybe this is just me, some of the moves with simple inputs either don't work or do another move instead. You do have two or three chances to actually input the move correctly. If you fail, you'll just do a standard attack, which doesn't cost any SP. SP being the MP equivalent. You can just keep it old school and simple by picking these moves in a menu instead and turning off the fighting game input mode. I think it would have been cool to do a hybrid of both by rewarding the player with bonus damage if you manage to correctly input the move. We also have the meaner system from Sam Show that increases when you get hit, 
allowing you to do your super move. Think of this as almost like a limit break. When going into the overworld, the spawn rate of enemies is very high, whether you're walking or not. I'm gonna assume this was a deliberate choice by the developers, since the destinations in the overworld are relatively close and this might have been the best way to cram those battles in. The story takes place during the first Samurai Showdown, where the main antagonist is Amakusa. You can actually choose to play the second chapter of this game first, which I'm assuming takes place during Samurai Showdown 2, where you face off against Raishoujin Mizuki, the final boss of Sam Show 2. With all six characters in the second chapter, it starts off with the same nicotine caffeine writing them a letter to come to a town in Japan. The second chapter is not as special as the first, since based on what I've seen, the characters don't have any unique story from each other unlike the first chapter. I do recommend starting with the first chapter since it sets the story for every character pretty well, but it's cool they give you this option to play essentially the sequel to the game right off the bat. The English translated version is only for the Neo Geo CD release, which is the best version anyways, compared to the cut down animations of the PS1 and Saturn versions. Beating the Neo Geo CD one will have you play an epilogue chapter with a character not playable normally. I won't spoil who that is, but that's mostly because I don't have footage of it myself. Of all the games here, I personally recommend this one above all the others, especially if you're an RPG fan and not really a Samurai Shodown one, since I do think it's a good gateway into the series. I know there's a shitload of games I didn't even mention, like the KOF mobile game that was only on the PC and didn't even release in Europe, Japan, or the US but Thailand. Or the PC game that stars Lilith from Darkstalkers called Lilith Throttle, where you have to navigate a stage to collect items to move on to the next one. Dynasty Warriors is kind of in a weird gray area, since the first Dynasty Warriors was a fighting game on the PS1, but the subsequent games went in a different direction and never looked back. Does Street Fighter Cross Mega Man even count, since it was a fan game Capcom just allowed to exist? If there's some spin-off I didn't mention here, let me know. I think this practice of having a fighting game series going outside its comfort zone and genre is something I wish happened more often. But as games become more expensive to make, it's difficult for developers to be as experimental as they were in past generations. I would like indie game companies to give it a shot one day. Maybe make a smaller scale game like a Soul Calibur Metroidvania, a turn-based retro-style RPG, or a Mortal Kombat dating sim. Get weird with it, I don't care. But these fighting game series are owned by much bigger companies that probably wouldn't trust an indie developer, no matter how experienced they are, to make a game they don't have full creative control over. I suppose we'll just have to have the fighting game themselves go outside their own genre, which we've seen in the past with Tekken Bowling and Force Modes, and even today with the World Tour Mode in Street Fighter VI. I suppose we have to be patient for a studio to give it another crack.